But the other point I want to make about chapter 4 on is that you don't see the church on earth any longer until, until the church returns with Jesus Christ at the second coming. And you read that in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation where uh, Jesus is returning on, on a horse, a white horse, and um, it describes him wearing many crowns and having a name that no one understands, no one knows but himself, but the name that's written on him is the Word of God. And that's an amazing name. But he returns, and then we see him shut down Armageddon, and we see him just kind of take care of business on planet Earth, ending tribulation and ushering in the millennial kingdom where Christians are told we will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years during that period of time. And I tell you that ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years is pretty awesome. Uh, I, I think about the things that we might do, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't tickle our ego because we're not going to rule in high positions of power and, and uh, have ruling over people. We might think of you know, having employees or people that report to us, subordinates, that's not how we're going to rule and reign. And that's not how Jesus ruled either when he was here. He said, I have come to serve, not to be served. And so our ruling and reigning is, a, is going to be a matter of serving the population during the Millennial Kingdom. And there'll be all sorts of people in the, in the Millennial Kingdom, all sorts of uh, types of people uh, in the Millennial Kingdom. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But it's not just going to be you and me. And it's going to be... Uh, it's going to be pretty awesome. But the church is not on earth any longer. And you see the church represented in heaven during this period of time by the 24 elders. And you see these 24 elders that are casting their crowns before the Lord and they're on their knees most of the time. And you read about them and it's pretty amazing. And I want to encourage you to read the book of Revelation and to pick up on these little details uh, about what's going on during this time because you have... From chapter 4 to chapter 19, you've really got two parallel stories going on, or accounts. You've got earth and you've got heaven. The things that are going on in heaven with the believers that are there now, and the things that are going on on earth uh, with the unbelievers and those that are becoming believers in the, in the wrath of God that's being poured out. Now in this, uh, in this chart you're looking at, and this kind of distributes it very evenly. It may not be as even as this thing does, but... It, uh, you see the, the three sets of judgments of God's wrath. You have the, the seal judgments, which include the four horse of the apocalypse. You've heard of them. And uh, then you see the trumpet judgments. And it, it, in the middle of that, you see the uh, breaking point between the first three and a half years of tribulation and the second three and a half years of tribulation, which is called the great tribulation. This is at this at this point is is where this antichrist, this world ruler that everyone has loved, and he's come to uh, power in the whole world. Uh, people have are following him. He has solved all of the problems of war in the Middle East, and in fact, war all over the world. You think, but he has uh, he has really <clears throat> captured the hearts of the human race as this leader that has finally come has finally come and is taking care of business and helping people. And so the world absolutely goes after him, just loves him, just loves him. But something happens at the, at the halfway point. He, he um, blasphemes the God and he, he blasphemes the, uh, the Holy of Holies in the, in the newly rebuilt temple. And we've read about this. He, it's the desolation or the abomination of desolation, which is prophesied. Some people believe that happened back in 70 A.D. when the Romans uh, came in with their banner and uh, destroyed the temple. But no, it didn't happen then. I don't believe at all that it happened then. I believe it's a future event. Too many, uh, too many things that are different when you go through the account of what uh, what happens to the temple uh, then and what happened to the temple now. But we. God treats us to foreshadowings of uh, what's going to come so that we're, we're, we understand when we read Revelation, we don't just think of it, we shouldn't just think of it as a spiritual book and it's mixing, uh, mixing and matching things that have happened in history uh, that we might be able to pick up on those things because if we do that, I think we're going to be very confused because there's a lot of things in the Bible, in Revelation, in Daniel that aren't going to line up, that aren't going to add up. And so... To spiritualize it is a good way to get out of trying to understand it. We can just say, well, it doesn't matter. A thousand years or two thousand years, what's a millennia after all? Well, a millennia is a thousand years. 
Well, no, it's just a spiritualized symbolic thousand years, so that it could be 2,500 years. Well, then why did God say a millennia? Why did God say a thousand years? That's my question. It, and it just frustrates me. Why did God say this if he meant this? Or does God not mean what he says? I thought that was Satan who offered confusion, not God. I thought God was the father of, of understanding and, and truth, and Satan was the father of lies and confusion. So now I'm confused, sir, <laughs> you might say. But I believe that uh, as we get into the, we get to talk about the millennial kingdom, that it will be a thousand years. And Satan will be locked up in a pit, the bottomless pit, for that thousand years. And he will not be able to influence very much. There will be uh, minimal sin during the millennial kingdom. Maybe somebody might steal a Three Musketeers bar from the local store or something like that. But sin will be accounted for. But it'll be very minimal because there won't be Satan and his demons there to influence you. It'll probably just the residual of the memory uh, for those that have uh, uh, come into the millennial kingdom. But, you know, they will have been glorified. Those that, uh, no, excuse me, those that come into the millennial kingdom will not be glorified. Uh, those that return with Jesus are glorified at the rapture. But if people got saved or a person gets saved in tribulation and they live through it, which is pretty rare, uh, from what I understand, because it's, it's punishable by death, and, and so it's a, there's a big bounty out on the heads of new believers, but there are going to be some that will make it, and, uh, and they will be the ones, a lot of them will be the ones that have hidden themselves as they were told to in Matthew 24, that they were told to hide themselves, to go into the wilderness uh, for the three and a half years. And I believe that they are going to be in a location that we call today Petra, which is a city carved out of the stone in, uh, in Jordan, in southern Jordan. And if you haven't been there, I really want to encourage you to make the trip to Israel someday and add the couple of days to go to Petra. You will not regret it. You will not regret it at all. There's plenty of those trips that you, you can get uh, signed up with uh, David Jeremiah or, or others that... Um, that you can go, Jack Swindoll, uh, they always have these great trips or cruises or whatever they, they are, but just go, go with your church. And especially in these days, not because it's violent these days, but because these are the days that, uh, that the Bible has been pointing to. I think that we live in it, that we're very blessed and privileged to live in this generation. I really do. And uh, that's because I believe so much that we are, we are right at the edge, right at the door uh, of Jesus uh, making himself very known to the whole world. It's going to be exciting, folks. It's going to be very exciting. I hope you're in agreement. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. Amen. amen out there. All right, amen out there. So, looking at the chart, we get the idea, uh, we get the, uh, the picture of the judgments that are going to take place. And so now, the questions might come up in your mind, about these, about the rapture, about the timing of the rapture, because there's, this is where there's a, a division that goes at least five ways. I'm sure there's others too that aren't as popular that they, you know, they're not on the radar as much. But I'm going to talk about five different uh, uh, interpretations of the rapture of the church, and or the lack of rapture of the church, as it were. And so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to start with uh, my favorite. I'm going to start with another one. And we're going to go to, is that too small to see? You've got it in your book there. So if you're following along, it's in your book. But we're going to start with the post-tribulation rapture. And I want to tell you some things about this. The post-tribulation rapture, obviously, from what it says, is at the end of the tribulation period. And this is a time um, that we look forward to the second coming of Christ. That he has he has promised to return, and uh, and and everything is pointing to his his return. This is page nineteen of your book if you if you haven't found it. So the question that uh, was just before that, you know, is uh, what what do you believe? And when it comes to timing of the rapture of the church, believers are very divided. Although it seems that the pre-tribulation camp is the largest of the five camps. Now, there may be some of you in this room that are of other camps. And so please understand that I'm not here to slam that. 
I'm, I'm just teaching about them all, but I am going to tell you, and I'm probably going to sound biased because I am biased to one, and that's the pre-tribulation camp. But it is, it is uh, not because it is the one of the top beliefs in the in Christendom, and it's the bigger camp. But I, I believe it because there's the most evidence in Scripture for this. It makes the most sense, at least to me. And maybe those that are in other camps just think, well, you're just not smart enough to really understand what the truth is. I don't think that's what it is. I'm not saying I'm smart. I'm just saying that the evidence that God has given us uh, for the rapture and for the pre, uh, pre-tribulation rapture is very, very strong and would probably win in the court of law. But the... Uh, the pre-tribulation rapture uh, the camp is the largest. Many many believers hold tightly to the uh, to these other views: mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, uh, pre-wrath, and partial rapture. But most to the pre, uh, but most hold to the premillennial view. Um, in many of those views, in fact, all of them except one, the premillennial view says that Jesus will return first and then set up the millennial kingdom. Hence, pre-millennial. And so there are other millennial views as well that we'll look at, but that Jesus would return and set up his millennial kingdom at the end of tribulation gives you a a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial flavor. And I think this is probably the greatest greatest understanding, or the best way to understand it. Well, the pre-millennial view in conjunction with their view of rapture, we should also talk about this later in the section. So, Having discussed the topic in these general terms, we're going to now look more closely at these five five, uh, pictures of rapture. So looking at the chart that uh, illustrates the view of post-tribulation rapture, excuse me, uh, post-tribulation rapture, I'm not talking about pre-tribulation now, I got ahead of myself, but of post-tribulation rapture, we can see from the chart the cross, this is the crucifixion, and the space between the cross and the first line is the church age. This represents uh, 2,000 plus years. Not, it hasn't ended yet. So, but 2,000 plus years uh, from the crucifixion of Christ. And that other line, or somewhat, or it represents the, uh, also the resurrection, the crucifixion resurrection of Christ, the church age which began with the day of Pentecost. You read that, of course, the book of Acts, where the church began. The church was ignited. The Holy Spirit came. And now this is that space between, uh, can you remember, between um, week 69 and week 70 of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. Week 69 ended at the moment that Jesus rode in on Palm Sunday, then was crucified on Good Friday of that week and then um, was resurrected on that following uh, Sunday. We call it Easter. I like to call it Resurrection Sunday. That, that begins uh, the church age um, and, and uh, the Holy Spirit's uh, work right after that. Did I hear a question out there? Okay. So you can see the tribulation period, uh, that seven-year period that is in between the, uh, the two lines there. Uh, so at the end of the church age, we have the tribulation period. And we see that the rapture of the church is really simultaneous with the second coming of Christ. Now, some of the problems with this are that you have this going and coming. Some, some people believe it's just the very same event, same moment that uh, we go up in that twinkling of an eye and we come back with Jesus. We get up there just in time to get on our horse because it says that we will be, the inhabitants of heaven will be behind Jesus on, on horses as well. And whether it's uh, post mid, most mid or pre, I think it's still going to be the greatest day of horseback riding in all the history of the world, don't you? That we're going to be in white robes and we're going to be on great horses and we're going to be behind Jesus and we don't have to lift a sword. We don't have to fight the battle. So it's going to be a great, a great time. So in the post-tribulation, pre-millennial position, the rapture would be identical to the second coming of Jesus or as a meeting in the air with Jesus that immediately precedes his return to the earth before the literal millennium. The post-tribulation position places the rapture at the end of the tribulation 
post-tribulation writers define the tribulation period as a generic sense as the entire present age. So, when you read through the scriptures and you understand what this present age looks like and you understand what tribulation looks like, I have a really hard time with that because as bad as it can be, I don't think that we're anything near what it is supposed to be in tribulation. With the number of people dying in such a short period of time because of war, because of uh, natural phenomena in the, in the atmosphere and on the earth, uh, the, the death toll is horrific. Um, it's given in the Bible in percentages. And so we can calculate based on the world population today how many people that would be. And it's a, it's a bunch. It's a bunch. We think the world uh, population today is what? I mean, that's me. Is it uh, 7 billion people now, or is it more than that? I have that figure in my head, and I lost it. But whatever it is, a half, a half of those will be uh, killed throughout the entire seven-year period. And so we haven't seen that. We haven't seen that. So I, I have a hard time understanding, unless that's a spiritual concept too, I have a hard time understanding how we can be considered as living in that time now. It, it, there are things missing uh, from the equation. Uh, the signing of a peace treaty with Israel, for instance. Um, the, the, the things that uh, are supposed to be happening with the believers in heaven. The believers aren't in heaven. The believers are here. The peace that is supposed to reign in the millennial reign. Uh, I don't think so. I don't, I don't experience that. And I don't know that you do too, but maybe there's a whole other way of looking at that and looking at a spiritual view of the book of Revelation that would, that would take uh, the subject and just spiritualize it in order not to have to explain it very well. And, and that's kind of what I feel. Um, the millennial kingdom, of course, would immediately follow so that they're, they're of a premillennial view as well. And so that's, that's correct, I think. That's correct. And then... The last judgment, by the way, that last judgment, we read in Matthew 25, is the great white throne judgment. This is, this is the time when we're not judged, but all the unbelievers that had died are going to be resurrected to this throne, to this uh, great white throne, and they are going to be judged. And they're going to have an opportunity to present their case in heaven uh, to the Lord. And... Uh, that's why Jesus said in Matthew uh, 7, uh, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, except for those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. And what would be the will of our, His Father in heaven? That we would repent, that we would receive Jesus, and that we would be saved. That's the will of the Father. You know, if we have not done that, and that we're now resurrected to this throne, and we're looking in the face of Jesus and there's angels standing around and the books are open and we're saying, but Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do miracles in your name? And didn't we, didn't we, didn't we? And the shopping list of reasons why we belong in heaven would be endless. And, and Jesus will listen. He will listen. That's just the way our God is. But then he's going to He's going to end that conversation with, I think, the four scariest words in the Bible. You know what they are? I never knew you. Did you? Could you imagine? I mean, we're so looking forward to hearing, well done, good and faithful servant, but to, to hear those words from the Lord, I never knew you? Oh my goodness. Be gone from me, you workers of iniquity, you, you lawless people. Well, that's what he says in uh, Matthew 20 or 7.21. And that's what he's saying to all of those that are coming up with all of the reasons that they belong in heaven. He says, I never knew you. And it just speaks volumes about the need to have a special relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I put that out there as an invitation. At the end of this evening, we'll have an invitation. To, if there is anyone in this room that hasn't truly given their lives to Christ, perhaps... Perhaps tonight is acceptable time of salvation for you. We're not going to let that opportunity go. They support it sometimes. The, uh, the emphasis in this view is, 
that the church will undergo the tribulation? I don't think so. Matthew 24, 29 through 31 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will give off its light and stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the signs of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And, and yes, that's what Jesus will do. He won't miss any of his, of his uh, uh, believers at the rapture. He won't miss a one. Even the dead, we talked about that yesterday. Even the dead, no matter how long dead, and how, uh, how much or how little is left of the corruptible and all of the mortals that are Christians, there's not going to be one that can hide. Psalms 139, of course, we said yesterday too that, that David said that there is no place that I can hide from your presence. So, the preceding verses is cited as a foundational scripture for this view, that verse. But the post-tribulation believer perceived the rapture as occurring simultaneously with the second coming of Christ. Upon Jesus' return, believers will meet him in the air and then accompany him as he returns to earth. Just going to make a U-turn. But, but 1 Thessalonians says that we're going to meet the Lord in the air and thus we will be with him. Um, and nothing is said about coming right back until the end of tribulation. So the world is going to go through this tribulation. So uh, 11, uh, Revelation 11.15 11, further supports um, the view. And then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, and the kingdoms of the world have been become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. In other words, the seventh trumpet, and uh, that can somehow be associated with um, kind of the end. Uh, but it's not. It's not. So, there are some authors and teachers that, uh, that, as you can see, that support this post-tribulation view. And there are some names there. And that's why I put them down there, because there's some names that are very familiar uh, to us, like Pat Robertson, uh, Walter Mount, uh, Martin, and John Piper, George Ladd, Robert uh, Gundry, Douglas Moo. These are, um, these are proponents of the post-tribulation rapture. So from there, any thoughts? Okay, from there, we're going to go to the mid-tribulation rapture. And, of course, that's page 21 <laughs> in the book. But that is also uh, accompanied with a premillennial view uh, of the millennial kingdom. So this, this is interesting because it, it puts the uh, rapture of the church in the middle of the tribulation. And I want you to notice something up there at the top of that green arrow. It says the word Bema is there. This is correct because the bima is the is the, uh, the Christian word for judgment seat, and this is not something that's called the bima seat of judgment in the Word of God. But we are understood uh, understanding the time of Christian judgment in heaven in First Corinthians chapter three, and I'm going to share this with you just a little bit because this is good. So in chapter 3, starting in verse 5, it says, Well, who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. It kind of puts us in our places, people that are ministering the word of God to people, that we're not saving anybody. But what we're doing, when we just share Jesus with one person, we're planting seeds. And then maybe giving the opportunity to water those seeds by talking about it a little bit more, asking questions, overcoming objections. The things that we do in, in Christendom is a, lot, is a lot like I understood and remembered in my past career 
in my earlier life of, of sales and sales management. I used to sell heavy industrial equipment and warehouse equipment and um, for a while I was a salesman in that area and we sold forklifts and that sort of thing as well as logging equipment too, just heavy equipment in general. And then I became a sales manager for that. And, but over those years, I think over some 10 or 15, about 15 years of that part of my life, uh, I went to many conferences and many sales seminars and sales management seminars. And one of the common th uh, threads through those was a reminder, a constant reminder and repeated teaching to always remember to ask for the order. You don't sell anything and if you don't ask for the order. And so we would learn that when you're selling, you're, you're leading the, that person, you, you know that person needs that product that you're selling. Obviously he's got a big warehouse, he's got really heavy stuff in there, so he needs a forklift. And so you're trying to tell him why yours is better than the others and why you can justify a $10,000 more expensive uh, one than uh, $10,000 more than the competitors. And so you, you talk about these things and you invite objections, you invite them to, to ask you questions. And then you, you constantly throw in, uh, are you ready? Do you, would you like to sign this order now? Do you have any questions? And then the objections come. And then the, uh, the objections come and say, well, I need to talk. Well, who is it that you need to talk to? Should I be talking to that person? That sort of thing. Because people have a way of getting out. They don't want to be pinned down. And if you've ever talked to somebody about Jesus Christ, people get really edgy and they get really squirmy. And so we're not talking about selling Jesus to somebody because it's, a, it's an experience. They need to understand that Jesus is a relationship. It's not a product. But some of the principles of talking about Jesus are the same. If you evangelize somebody, you've been praying for somebody, you've got somebody at work that you've been talking to, talking to about Jesus and this person still just stays unsaved. Well, I've had people that I tried to sell to and I never said, are you ready to sign the order? What are your objections? Why won't you sign it today? Is there any questions I can ask? And we would say the same thing to a potential Christian. Would you like to pray with me right now? Are you ready to pray? You're not, well, why? Can I ask you, what, what are you afraid of? What is it that you don't understand? And so we, we're not being pushy, but we, we have to remember that this isn't just about selling a product to somebody. This is about somebody's eternal life. And we have been given a, a mandate in the Word of God, a great commission, to take on the responsibility of people's eternity. And I say that I'm responsible for people's souls as a pastor here at the, at the church and as a pastor at the mission. I'm responsible for their souls. I look out after them. I'm their shepherd. And no, I don't do anything to their souls that changes anything. But if I don't share the word of God and I don't ask him to give me the reasons that they won't share their life with Jesus now, then I'm as much condemning them as if I didn't say anything to them. So, the believers that are in heaven, I got there because we were talking about watering and planting seeds. That's our job. We don't save anybody. That's what God does. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So, then neither he who plants is anything, nor is he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building.